The doctrine of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, we're still on that theme of the coming of our Lord. And the incarnation is one of the most fascinating aspects of our redemption, one of the, one of the great doctrines and teachings of the church, both the incarnation and then, of course, the atonement, the death of Jesus Christ for the sins of the world and his resurrection and exaltation. I, um, I would say the theme would be Christ is making all things new. Christ makes all things new. And there's many reasons and purposes for the, the incarnation. Primarily, you, Jesus coming into the world to, to save sinners, to save the lost. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. But um, Jesus Christ comes to take upon himself our frail and our death-doomed humanity in order. He takes it upon himself in order to make it new. So he comes into our world, takes upon himself our humanity, and our humanity, of course, is frail and death-doomed. He came to die for the sins of the world. This he has done and will yet make all things new as a result of his incarnation, his life, his death, his resurrection and exaltation to the Father's right hand. His exaltation to the Father's right hand is the clear indicator that he has accomplished all of God's purposes in bringing about our salvation and will therefore complete all that he has promised. It's really beautiful when you think that his seat being seated at the right hand of the Father the scriptural teaching that he is exalted above all and that he has fulfilled God's will and purposes for our salvation. And then Paul the Apostle will say, we've been raised up, and this is in Ephesians 2, 6, we've been raised up with him and made to be seated in heavenly places. What was Paul saying there? The Apostle Paul was saying, our salvation is that guaranteed. As much as Christ, like the song we sang, is, we can look to him, Christ seated in heaven, and realize that I've been raised by faith in Jesus Christ. I've been raised with him and made to be seated in heavenly places with Christ. And Paul says in Colossians, our lives are hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ appears, we will also appear with him in glory. Those are statements of, um, of, of guarantee, I guess you could say, the, the, the certainty, the assurance that our salvation is complete in Christ. In fact, Paul says in Colossians, we are complete in Christ. And so we can rejoice in that wonderful assurance. I'm quite sure this message that I have um, printed out here will probably, um, especially with limitations of time, go for two weeks, perhaps. Um, there's just too much, uh, there's so much, there's so much teaching in the New Testament on the Incarnation, and I, I, I don't want us to miss the beauty of this teaching. I've um, actually titled the message, Christ Incarnate, the New Creation, because we're gonna be looking at the Incarnation in light of the new creation. Now, neither the noun incarnation nor the adjective incarnate is found anywhere in the Bible. Okay? I mean, you've got a doctrine that's got a name and the name's not in the Bible. Well, there's actually several doctrines where the title for the doctrine's not in the Bible, but the teaching surely is. See, the word is based on a Latin translation of the Greek. The Greek says ensarki, ensarki, S-A-R-K-I. And, um, and it means in flesh. Ensarki means in flesh, a term used several times in the New Testament. The Latin translation of the Greek says in carne, in carne, in body, in flesh. So that's where we get the word incarnation. It's from the Latin translation of the Greek phrase. The Bible's very clear about the incarnation and 
you know, we looked a couple of weeks ago at 1 Timothy 3.16 that talks about how great is the mystery of God because it says he was manifested in the flesh. He, Christ, was manifested in the flesh. Now, the Textus Receptus, the Byzantine-type manuscripts that the King James and the New King James translation are based on, has the phrase, God was manifested in the flesh, rather than just the word, he. Of course, the scholars go back and forth as to which manuscript is more accurate, but they really both have the same idea. 1 John 4, 2 states this. John says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. He's dealing with a heresy at the time called docetism and where there was um, a, this philosophy that evil and God could never possibly touch each other. Therefore, the word docetic, the, the, the word that brings out the idea of it, Jesus just seemed to be in a body. He was like a phantom. It wasn't real flesh and blood. It was just what looked like it, a phantom, a, something that seemed like a human being. And John is dealing with that heresy in his first epistle. And he is saying to us that, no, if you aren't confessing that Jesus Christ has truly come, the Son of God has truly come in the flesh, real humanity, real flesh, if you're not confessing that, then you don't know God, you don't know the Spirit of God. Because the, the Spirit of God will bring about truth in our hearts. In, sec, in his second epistle, verse 7, he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. What's really interesting is in Paul's, the Apostle Paul and his exhortation to the Ephesian elders in the book of Acts chapter 20, even talks about the blood. He uses the phrase, the blood of God. Not that God in his essence, in his being has blood, but just the recognition of that Christ was so united with his humanity that he could actually call Christ's shed blood the blood of God that he shed for us. And one particular scripture I'd like to read is in 1 John. This is how he begins his holy epistle. Just, um, just the first four verses. First four verses in chapter 1. 1 John is one of the final epistles in the New Testament. At 1 John, then 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and then Revelation. Now, keeping in mind what I said about docetism, um, that heresy of Christ not really being in flesh and only seeming like it, and what John had already said about believing that Jesus Christ has come into flesh, this is going to make a lot of sense here. It's a strong apologetic by the Apostle John. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the life, the word of life. The life was manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Our joy is complete in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here, John is making it so clear. It's interesting in the Greek when it says, 
um, we have seen with our eyes and have looked upon. The word to see there is the word to gaze, like a prolonged gaze. And then to look upon, we, we saw him in action and we gazed at him. I mean, John, I can imagine in particular, you just imagine his heart for the Lord and he was the one who at the supper put his head on Jesus' chest. He said, we gazed on him. I mean, prolonged stares. This was not, this was not a phantom. We stared at him. We gazed upon him. We looked at him and we heard him and we touched him with our very hands. And who was it we were touching? Who was it that we were seeing and gazing upon? It was a real man, real humanity, but he was also the one who is life itself, the one who is eternal life, who was with the Father and then came into the world taking upon flesh. That's fascinating. So John is saying this man, it was a real human being, a real man. I lived with him for three and a half years. And I'm telling you, he's God. That's amazing to somebody that had lived with him like that. To acknowledge that he is so much more than just a man, but he was truly man. So those are wonderful scriptures to keep in mind about the incarnation he was that's the mystery of our faith he was manifested in the flesh i have a quote here and i ask you just to hang hang in there with me just for a moment it's not long but at the beginning there's a couple words you may not be familiar with or you may be i'm not sure but it's just a quote i took out of a are you ready for this a bible dictionary <laughs> I was thinking of that when I was typing this out last night that um, you can go home and tell your friends while well, at church, our pastor quoted out of a Bible dictionary. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so anyways, but um, the, the, um, this statement is going to reveal something to us that I think that is really, really important about this mystery of the incarnation, but also the many other mysteries that we see in the Bible. Uh, the, the incarnation, of course, Jesus being fully God, fully man, and um, the, the mystery of the Trinity, of course, or the sovereignty of God and man's free will, and all those kind of things that, that we can't wrap our brains around. And this is what this particular um, writer said in this dictionary. He said, the New Testament writers nowhere notice, much less handle, the metaphysical questions about the mode of the incarnation. How did it happen? How is it physically possible? Um, so the New Testament writers didn't concern themselves with the mode of the incarnation and the psychological questions about the incarnate state, which have been so prominent in Christological discussion since the fourth century. Christological, the study of Christ. And if you study the early church, especially the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople and Chalcedon, um, Nicaea being in 325 AD and um, Constantinople 381 and Chalcedon in 451, that's what they were trying to resolve is all these questions that were coming up. Well. If he's God and man, does that mean he has two wills? Does it mean he has two minds, two, per, two personalities? Or was it a mixing of deity and humanity and into something new and different, which it couldn't have been, because whatever he would have formed didn't need redemption. <laughs> and he doesn't become less than God. He doesn't um, get rid of anything, <laughs> empty himself, I should say, of anything that makes him who he is, God, and as a person. So they were dealing with all these questions, and what this article is saying is the New Testament does not deal with those things. This is so good. He says, their interest, and I love this is the simplicity of the gospel, their interest in Christ's person is not philosophical and speculative but it's religious and evangelical. 
Evangelical means they're concerned with sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. They speak of Christ not as a metaphysical problem, but as a divine savior. And all that they say about his person, all that the New Testament writers say about his person is prompted by their desire to glorify him through exhibiting his work and vindicating his centrality in the redemptive pur purpose of God. Let me just read that one sentence again. Where they, what they say about his person is prompted by their desire to glorify him through exhibiting his work and vindicating his centrality in the redemptive purposes of God. For example, in Philippians 2, 5 to 11, Paul starts out by saying, though he was in the form of God, he thought not equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he doesn't explain how that could be. He just simply says, he, though eternally existing in the form of God, takes upon himself the form of a man. Why? To become obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him the name above all names. So Paul is concerned with talking about the humbling of Christ the self-emptying of Christ, to become a slave, to become a servant, to die on the cross for us, and, that, and then to be exalted to the Father's right hand. He's not talking about how, how that's possible or what is the mode of his person. And it's not that those things aren't important and the church needed to define some of those things because of the heresies that were erupting, the misbeliefs, the wrong beliefs. So that it wasn't wrong that the church was bringing definition to it, but what we see in the New Testament is, is that they didn't seem to have a concern for explanation, anything philosophical or speculative. They just stated the truth. Praise God. And then to finish this quote, they never attempt to dissect the mystery of his person. It is enough for them to proclaim the incarnation as a fact, one of the sequence of mighty works whereby God has wrought salvation for sinners. The only sense in which the New Testament writers ever attempt to explain the incarnation is by showing how it fits into God's overall plan for redeeming mankind. I think that's a wonderful lesson for us in many of the mysteries we face in Scripture. We can bang our heads against the wall and try to figure out how, how, how can it be? How can Christ be fully God, fully man, truly God, truly man at the same time and yet be one person, one personality, one will? <laughs> how is that possible? Well, we don't know, and I don't think we'll ever grasp that reality perhaps better when we get to heaven but even then I don't know if we'll all fully grasp what an infinite mind has determined to bring about for our salvation so I hope that's helpful and there's something for us to keep in mind in it as we grapple with some of these things and one of my favorite quotes from John Kelvin and he was talking about the sovereignty of God and man's free will but he said if you're trying to figure out the eternal counsels of God. He said it's like walking into a maze of which there's no escape. You can never figure it out. You'll just become more and more and more and more frustrated. But what we can do is celebrate the truths that it brings out. The truth that Christ, the eternal Son of God, eternally face to face with the Father in glory has manifested himself to us. He's come to speak to us in a manner 
that we can understand as human beings. We couldn't comprehend God. It's um, like Tom's, uh, Tom's testimony before about Niagara Falls. And yeah, we've seen it several times from both sides, the American and the Canadian side, and it's, it is stunning. And when you do put the raincoat on and you go down to one of the falls and you approach it pretty close, it is amazing as to how powerful it is, you know. And, um, and God, is, God is so much greater than anything he's created. He's, he's greater than that and more awesome and stunning than Niagara Falls. And so what he does is he comes and speaks to us in a way that we can understand he comes as a man. Um, I read a book a long time ago, probably in the early 80s, by Hal Lindsey. And even though I don't like his eschatology that much, um, this particular book, he made a really good point about Christ's coming into the world as a man, taking upon himself our humanity. He said it's like this, and he, not that the illustration is ne necessarily great, but it makes the point, okay? He said, you've got a big ant hill, and there's a bulldozer headed toward that ant hill. And the, the gap between a human being and an ant is very significant <laughs> for what our minds are capable of. And actually, the gap between you and me and God's mind is even greater because it's an infinite gap. It's not an infinite gap between an ant and our brains, but it is between God's mind and ours. So he says a bulldozer is heading toward that hill and you want those ants to get out of there. Well, if you bend over as a human being and try to talk to them, <laughs> chances are they're not going to heed you. Of course, we could dig them out of there maybe, but anyways. So he says you remaining fully human so you can communicate what's happening you also become an ant at the same time so you can communicate with them. And say, there's a bulldozer coming. You guys need to get out of here fast. Line up. Let's go. So, like I said, there's, uh, any illustration is going to have its weaknesses. But I think that's a, that's a good idea, the humanity and the ant. As a human being, you can tell them exactly what's going on. And as an, but you can only do it as an ant because they wouldn't comprehend your humanity if you tried to speak with them. And so Jesus Christ takes upon himself our humanity so that infinite, eternal deity, God himself, can come face to face with us. He who has been face to face with the Father for all eternity comes down to be face to face with us in a way that we can hear and understand. He takes upon his huma our, our humanity not only to communicate to us, for he proclaims the truth to us. He reveals God to us. John's gospel says no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. He has revealed him. So not only that, but he also comes to take upon our broken, frail humanity so that he can make it all new again, so that he can deliver us from our destruction so he can shout to us and say, hey, the bulldozer's coming, and it's going to wipe everyone out. And uh, John Bunyan brings out that idea in the Pilgrim's Progress. He's in a city of destruction, and he's saying, we got to get out of here. And we got to get onto the king's highway and head to the celestial city, because fire will come down and destroy this city of destruction that we all live in. Brings out the same idea. So Jesus comes to speak to us takes upon himself our humanity so that he can communicate with us and then die in our place because only a human being can pay the price for sin because it was man that sinned and rebelled, but there is no sinful human being that could possibly ever do that. So therefore, one who is himself sinless, the Lamb of God, the spotless Lamb of God, dies in our place, and that's why he comes into this world. He comes to communicate to us. He comes to bring forgiveness. And he also comes to make a new creation. There's two more passages of scripture, and it's as far as I'm going to go today, and the rest will 
continue with next week. I'll review a little bit and then we'll, we'll finish it. But let's just take a moment to go back to the book of Genesis. It's the easiest book in the Bible to find along with Revelation. Because you the first or the last. So. Genesis all the way back to chapter 1, verse 1. To take note of some of the language that's used here, some of the images that we see. Genesis 1. We're just going to read um, the first three verses and the first sentence in verse 4. Where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. We can stop there. So we see in the beginning, God creates. The earth had, was without form and void and there was darkness. But what does he do? He brings light. He says, let there be light. It's by the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. Really significant imagery here that we're going to see. Let's go now to John's Gospel, chapter 1. And look at some of the similarity in language that is used. In John's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Even the very first three words, in the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Sim similarities between these two passages, the words in the beginning, goes back to the very beginning, to the Genesis account. We see the creation of light in Genesis. We see that Jesus Christ comes, and his life is now the light of men. He brings light into a world that's been darkened by evil and sin. So the word darkness is seen in Genesis chapter 1. There was darkness over all the earth, formlessness, emptiness, a great void and dark and flooded. The word for creation, Jesus, all things were created, it says in John's Gospel here, all things were made through him. All things that were created were made through Jesus Christ. Of course, Genesis 1 talks about creation. God speaks the word in Genesis 1. Literally in the Hebrew it says, light be. Now that's the power of God, okay? Who can create light? Think about that for a moment. <laughs> and then just to simply speak, light be, and then there's light. Jesus is the word now who brings light to the world. And what does he do in creation in Genesis 1? But he brings out life. We'll see the creation of light as a result of the departure of the darkness and of the coming of light. We will then see life. Of course, that's a theme in all of John's Gospel, the themes of light and life, and we see it here as well. What we're beginning to see here, and we'll get into this more next week, what we're beginning to see is the cosmic um, consequence, if you could use that word, of the incarnation of Christ. 
Yes, he comes, goes to the cross and dies so that I can have eternal life and my sins forgiven. But it's so much bigger than that. It's a whole new creation that he's coming to bring. That little baby that was in the manger was the incarnate God, the one who makes all things new. When the angel came to Mary to say to Mary, you're going to be with child and he's going to be the son of David and he will reign over the house of David forever and ever. And Mary says, well, how can that possibly be since I don't know a man, I'm a virgin. And the angel says, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, that holy child who will be born of you will be called the Son of God. Once again, we have the imagery of the original creation. We see the Spirit of God coming over the darkness of the womb of the Virgin Mary, the power of God overshadowing her, and the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. And I gotta say that little tiny child in her womb, because we're children, we're human beings from the time of conception, Christ Jesus at that moment was now in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the one who would make all things new. The beginning, that's the beginning of a new creation in the womb of the Virgin Mary. That's extremely <coughs> exciting. We need to, as believers, have a big view. It's not just about my life being a little happier and smoother. In fact, many times becoming a Christian makes it just the opposite. But at the same time, if I could say this, at the same time it might make it the opposite in the sense that we'll face suffering in various ways. With the new eyes that God gives us, we can appreciate the things that God has created more than perhaps somebody who doesn't know the Lord. And we can have hope in the midst of our darkness, light in the midst of our darkness. But we need to have that big view that it's not just about that, though it is very much so. Forgiveness of sins, eternal life. I'll be with the Lord. I'm going to heaven at that day, and someday there'll be all new heavens and a new earth. That's the big plan. And we need to, as believers, to remember the cosmic ramifications of the cross of Jesus Christ. Let me close with this. In the movie, The Passion of the Christ, and I think I think, Vicki, you pointed this out to me. I didn't kind of catch it when I was watching the movie. But what happens when, in that movie, I don't know how many people here saw The Passion of the Christ, but um, at the moment when, in that movie, when Christ dies on the cross, the ca ca camera kind of goes out and looks up from above a little bit. And you see this one drop of rain come down. It's like slow motion and land in a puddle of rain and the big splash comes out. It's just this little imagery that something huge has just happened. That's what the camera and the angle of the camera and so on is trying to bring out is something cosmic, a great cosmic event has just occurred at the moment Jesus says, it is finished and he died. As a result, someday all of creation will be made new and will continue this next week. Praise God.